As an immigrant, making a new life in Canada could be the answer to your dreams. But how is your credit? Discover the important tips on building credit in Canada. Then, divorce? Found a new partner? Find out what you need to know before repartnering. And are all your boxes of old tax records piling up? Learn what to do with them. All this and more on The Wealthy Life. What do you think is the number one way to build credit? To have a credit and pay it off in a timely fashion, not to carry debt, uh, and, and do manage that as, as best you can. Unfortunately, to build credit, you got to owe people money. So I would say start off small, get a small credit card or whatnot, go to Canadian Tire or whatnot, start from there, build it from there, and then get into something with a little better interest rate. Making your payments on time? Yeah, I second that. <laughs> Today's guest is Maidha, a recent immigrant to Canada looking to build her credit. Maidha, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Tell me your background. Um, well, I'm from India. I um, recently moved to Canada about a year ago, mm -hmm. year and a half ago, and I live in Burnaby. And How, why Canada? How did you decide <laughs> to move to Canada? Well, I moved because of marriage. I'm, my husband lives in Can lived in Canada before. Yes. And we met, we got married, then it made more sense to move to Canada because it's BC is beautiful and he's a tenured professor and so he works he, here, yeah. So your husband had roots here. Yeah. But I'm a little confused because how did you meet your husband if you're in India and he's oh. in Canada? <laughs> How did that come to be? He's Indian too. Um, he just he lives in Canada he, for a few more years than me. Yes. Um, we met through friends, complicated friends, friends, friends introduced us, and uh, we spoke on Skype and on the phone and things like that. So when you did you meet him first virtually, meaning yeah. just through Skype? Yeah. We just met on Skype. Wow. Yeah. So kind of like a blind date, but through Pretty the internet. Much. Pretty much. It's uh, it's probably like a date, except you're not you're at your home and he's at his home. And yes. He was actually in his office. So. And um, was it love at first sight? Yeah, I'd like to think so. But we took our time to get married. But yeah. So how did you then eventually meet? Or before I ask that, how long were you doing this internet getting to know each uh, other before you met in uh, person? For a while, almost a year. Okay. And then um, we wouldn't talk so much all the time. We met in the in the beginning. We talk a lot, and then um, about a year later, he came to India, and I didn't know he was coming. And he was like, "Oh, I'm here. Let's meet up." So we met uh, in person, and then we decided to get married. He asked me, and we, I was like, "Yeah, for sure." <laughs> so and when married. he asked you to marry him, did he say, "But I want you to move to Canada"? Yeah, I, well, that was afterwards, but kind of understood it from the beginning. You were ready. Yeah, I was ready. Um, I was already working in India and things like that, but... What did, kind of work did you do in India? Oh, I was a professor, uh, assistant professor in, uh, in a school in India. What type of field? What business? Uh, oh, in so business. HR management, organizational behavior, and things like that. Oh, great. Yeah. And then when you moved to Canada, did you find it hard to get a job? Oh, yeah, that's uh, totally, th that's so difficult for somebody moving into Canada because your qualifications are different and everything. But I was really lucky because my husband said SFU. He had some contacts and things like that. So I wrote to a few professors. So I moved, I got a job as a postdoc and I moved here. Uh, Good. Here. So because you were married, it made it a lot easier oh, going yeah. through the immigration process Absolutely. as well. And also because he is here and he knows about the whole process and everything. So, so you're working. Oh, yeah. So yes, you're, you're married, <laughs> you're living in Canada. Do you miss your family in India? I do. Uh, but. We just went to meet them recently, so I'm I'm good. But I don't miss them a lot. No, <laughs> well, we won't tell them that, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do they come and visit you in Canada? Yeah, in a couple of months, they're planning to visit us. Uh, my husband's parents were here last year. My parents are uh, going to be here this year. 
Aww. for a while. Well, yeah. it sounds like you're settling into Canada quite nicely. Oh, yeah, I love it here. So what's your big question for me today? Oh, my big question is, as a new immigrant in Canada, how can I build my credit? Building credit is extremely important. So don't go away. Learn how to build credit after the break. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Welcome back. We're here with Maidha to learn how to build credit in Canada. So Maidha, welcome to Canada. <laughs> it sounds like you're doing great. You're married, you're employed, but you want to build some credit. Mm -hmm. Why do you think building credit is important? Oh, I think it's a uh, part of uh, per being in Canada, living here. So we want to buy a house or anything, you need credit worthiness. You do, you got it right. Eventually, you're going to want to borrow money for something and buying a house is a good thing to borrow money for. Building good credit is good for everybody, not just new immigrants. And so the tips we're about to go through today will help all of our viewers. So some ways of building credit. Number one, have a credit card. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a credit card? I do. Okay, so you should be building credit. Have you used it? No, I haven't. I'm kind of nervous about it. I'm afraid I will uh, use it and then I won't have, I won't pay it, then I will have a bad credit. Okay, so. so the one thing you need to know is having a credit card, that's great that you were given one because it's sometimes hard to get yeah. a credit card, but if you don't use it, you're not building credit. <laughs> so you have to use it to build credit. Yeah. One of the things I suggest is just set a little limit for yourself. Maybe, do you have a car? A car? Yeah, or... No, I don't have a car. Uh, how about groceries? Do you, oh, no. do you do the grocery shopping? Yeah. Why don't you use your credit card to buy your groceries? Oh, okay. And I want you to save, every time you go to get groceries, save the receipt. Oh, okay. You will have money in the bank to pay for your groceries, because is that how you normally pay for it? Yeah. Save your receipts every time you do that, mm -hmm. so that at the end of the month you know you need to leave that money in your bank account to pay your credit card off. Mm -hmm. And set up your credit card to automatically pay in full every month out of your bank account. Oh, okay. You'll yeah. never miss a payment. That's you'll good. always pay it off. And by doing that, you'll build credit. So having a card alone isn't enough. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you have other friends who are immigrants? Yeah, I do. Um, I have this one friend who, um, who's also moved in from India. And she doesn't work. She has a small business. Yes. And she has a lot of trouble getting a credit card. Okay, so she's also trying to build credit, yeah. but hasn't been able to get a credit card yeah. because she's self-employed. Yes. Typical issue. She may not know if she saves a little bit of money aside, even if it's $500, mm -hmm. she could go to the bank and put that in a savings account and use that savings as collateral to get a credit card from the bank. Okay. Yeah, and so that way she can start building credit, her credit limit will be small, but the bank says it's no problem because she's got collateral. If she doesn't make a payment, they'll just use the money out of that. That's good. So advice. that's a good tip for her, and that's yeah. actually a good tip for anyone who's having trouble getting a credit card for the first time. Hmm. Some other ways is make sure some of the bills are in your name, your phone, your cable. Do you okay. have a cell phone? Yeah. Good. Cell phone, most cell phone companies, they report your payments. Okay. So you start building credit by having a cell phone. Okay. So you're on your way there. Uh, other bills in your name? Uh, compass card. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but that's it. <laughs> so not all things and not all bills in your name will allow you to build credit. And you don't drive, so I take it you don't need to get a car because a car loan would be yeah. another way to start building yeah. credit in Canada. <laughs> but start small. Something else people don't realize is you actually build credit faster if you don't pay your credit card off in full every month. Really? I know. But I'm going to throw that out the window. I don't care if it takes you a little bit longer. Paying your credit card off in full every month is just a good habit to get into. Yeah. And one last tip is look at getting a line of credit on your checking account with your bank. Okay. That way when you pay your credit card off automatically every month, in case you're a little bit short, it'll just go into your line of credit. Oh, okay. So I hope that answers your question and thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. 
Stay tuned. Conversations you should have before repartnering after divorce when we return. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. With us today is financial advisor Tracy Themes, sharing tips for repartnering after divorce. Tracy, welcome to the show. Thanks. You have a very interesting background. Please mm -hmm. tell us about that. Well, it's a bit unusual for a financial advisor to have a psych background, but I studied psychology and was fully, fully intending on becoming a child psychologist. So I was uh, working as uh, doing, finishing up my PhD, working in the downtown east side as an infant de development consultant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had one of those crossroads kinds of experiences where um, near the end of my year there, three of the babies on my caseload died. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was devastated, but I was also shocked that the reason I felt that they died wasn't because of their developmental issues, it was because of economic reasons. And oh. I, I really felt that if they'd been on the west side, if, if, they'd had, if there was more money in their family, that the things that happened wouldn't have happened. So I was wow. plunged into a full-blown spiritual crisis, basically pounding my chest and saying, why are some people rich and some people poor? It just seemed so unfair. And I just felt like I couldn't continue on that path until I understood more about that. I mean, babies are wow. dying because there's no money in their family it's in the city right. that I live in. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a big deal because it takes a long time to do your PhD. And I was like right near the end and yeah. Was, well, the good news <laughs> is that psychology and your training actually does play an important part in what you do for people today. Yes, And it that does. awful experience you went through then jumped you ahead to yeah. trying to really make an impactful difference in yes. a different way. Yes. So as a financial advisor, what areas do you focus on? So, of course, families is a big, I mean, everybody's in a context we even working as a child psychologist you try to pull the kid out and try to fix them and then you put them back into a weirdo family and the child's going to revert to the same dysfunctional behaviors or functional as the case may be yes. and the family's dysfunctional well it's the same with money money doesn't exist out of context it has no meaning until we apply meaning to it so in a family you you think that it's twenty dollars is twenty dollars well it's not $20 is whatever value the people in your context assign it. And it means different things in different part of the city, it means different things to a man than to a woman, to a child than to an adult. So it, was, it ended up being highly applicable. So I thought I was studying money, but really what I was just doing was studying a more practical side of psychology yeah. and probably the most complex side of psychology in this day and age money is such an important currency yes. and it's so much emotion and so and problematic for people like it's the biggest bruise in a lot of humans life is this their relationship with money so well, all day long I'm a psychologist different. yeah so it is true, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I know that uh, I've met people who have an absolute mental block when they anything to do with money pops up like they yes. just no, I don't understand it. I, I, I don't understand. I don't want to know. I don't want to yes. think about it, yes. which is a very scary and dangerous place to be. They don't have to be the expert, but I really believe everybody needs to know at least the basics, just yes. the basics, so that you can be financially independent. Yes. And when you're independent, you have confidence. And when you have that financial independence, Yes. Sometimes you can prevent some of those bad things from happening. Yes. Now, when it talk when we talk about relationships, yeah. husbands and wives, I would say money is probably the one of the biggest reason people separate. Yeah. And then when people are repartnering again, I think that money gets skimmed over. I don't think people you, talk about it enough. They don't. So how so in our business at Sophia we started out really specializing because of my background in psychology and my business partner's background we started out specializing in people that were moving through the transitions out of marriage 
So you develop this, you develop your toolkit, and there are yeah. certain things you're working with lawyers and accountants and business valuators, and you're putting together these plans, and you're helping people bring as much fairness, as much uh, collaboration in the process as you can. Now we've been in business a decade, and aren't these same people getting their guts up and deciding to repartner? Yeah. Now you would think having gone through it once before and Maybe. knowing how <laughs> bad things could potentially be, that this time you'd have your eyes wide open. It's not actually the case. So this has become fascinating to us. It really is fascinating. Well, because people, people can change, but they don't usually change. And so they just kind of rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. We do. And I think I think there's so much social and emotional baggage around romantic love and what it means to actually have full, transparent conversations that people attach a lot of meaning to those conversations that I don't think is true. For instance, if you ask me how much my RSP is worth, it means I don't trust you. Uh, no, that's I'm not. just asking how right. much your RSP is. Right. right, and if I say, you know what, I think we should both do a net worth statement, and everybody freaks out, then I, I mean, you, the conversation becomes, why is this so touchy? And if it's touchy now, isn't it going to be touchy later? But and all the more reason people need to talk about it now, and I it know. can deepen those relationships. And you need to be—it's part of being open and transparent. And I think a second marriage or a third marriage, when you re-enter those relationships, you want to do so. Yes. Sharing yes. so that you have a good platform for a long, happy marriage. So the easy thing is saying that. Yes. The easy thing is making that prescription and walking around and beating our chests and saying, this is obvious that everybody has to have this conversation, but because of my background in psychology, I'm also interested in why we won't. Why and won't we? Well, we won't because we're assigning meaning to the conversation that may not exist. We, we think that we're communicating to a potential spouse who you're supposed to have the most trusting relationship with in the world. We're assuming that that means that we don't trust them. Also, women especially, we're making a broad-based uh, approach here, are not necessarily brought up to talk about money and may have been actually brought up that it was it's unseemly, it's not your role to talk about it. Um, there's also people are wounded. Uh, just what yes. I said, there's a lot of wounds around money. So they have maybe their guard up in their defense yes. mechanism. Right. So some of the things that that we, first of all, we provide practice questions for people. You know, here are some things. But the other piece that I, I work with folks is to, instead of, you know, thinking that this conversation's potentially going to be the end of our relationship or the end of our engagement, to just start getting very curious, but gently curious about it. And to lay groundwork um, to create the structure of the communication first. So the questions aren't as important as how do you think, like Sybil, how do you think you and I are going to talk about this? What are, no, no, I want to talk about, no, and how what will means. we talk about this? Okay, we only talk about this before we drink beer, before 4 p.m. Yep. Uh, when we're in a good mood. When we're in a good mood after we've both slept and, uh, and then you put parameters on it. Uh, everybody can call time out. Uh, as long as you say when you're going to come back into the conversation. So I think the first conversations are how will we have this conversation in a way that keeps us romantically with one another and in harmony with each other, but still allows us to dig in deeper to some of the things and nobody agrees on money. So setting that stage, Tracy, yes. then lines it up perfectly yes. for the questions people should be asking. Yes. Want to know the questions that you should be talking about? Contact us at thewealthylife.com to get your worksheet, which will go over the five big questions you should ask before repartnering. Okay. Tracy, thank you so much for being thank on you. the show today. Yes, it's a pleasure. <laughs> And when we return, what should be done with all those boxes of old tax records? Find out after the break. This letter segment is brought to you by Bridge House Asset Managers, dedicated to advancing Canadians' knowledge of investing.
Welcome back. Thanks for your letters, emails, tweets, and messages. Today's question is from Karsten in Hamilton. Dear Sybil, my wife is calling me a hoarder as I have a room full of old files, tax info, financial statements, manuals, and other important documents. I'm terrified of throwing something out that I might need at a later date, but I also don't want to leave a mess for someone else to clean up if I die. What do I need to keep and what can I throw out? Regards, Karsten. Yikes, I know that feeling. I've met people like you. You don't want to throw anything out because you're scared you might need it. You need to start now before this problem gets worse. Hopefully my tips will help you decide what you can get rid of and what you need to keep. Ask yourself, why is it important that you keep it? And can you find the information anywhere else? For example, all those manuals you have, most all, if not all of them, are available online. So I'd say, check them. You can pull them up on the internet anytime you need them. As far as old financial statements and bank statements, you can usually get duplicate copies, if you need it, from your current financial institution. If you haven't looked at some of those things for many years, why hold on to them? The one thing you do need to hold on to is anything that shows the proof of what you paid for something that you may sell at a later date, like stocks or real estate or art, because anything that's going to trigger a taxable gain, you need to have proof of your cost base, otherwise Revenue Canada will assume you paid zero and you'll have a huge tax bill. And as far as your tax records, keep them back at least six years. As for everything else, say bye-bye. And that wraps up this edition of The Wealthy Life, helping Canadians make smart financial decisions. Join the conversation on social media and tell us your story. Go to thewealthylife.com to ask your financial question and make the most out of what you have.